million thoughts going through my mind as I was listening to you, and, 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 and you know, floods of emotion um, and thoughts and memories. My children are adults now, grown, moved away from home. But it's amazing how much what you're saying stirs up memories. Mm. And I'm also thinking about um, one of the documentaries that we did a, a few years ago. We went up to the university, a university that was close to here, and we met with a group of young students who were in the, taking part in a mindfulness class. They, they were there because they had experienced anxiety. It wasn't maybe diagnosed as capital A anxiety, but they were experiencing anxiety. So I was asking them questions about what were you anxious about? And the reason is because uh, campus counselors across the country told us that this is the number one issue that young adults are mm. coming to them with now. Mm. It used to be a broken heart, and now it's pretty serious anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in the nuance of their answer, which was that they were worried about letting their parents down. Mm -hmm. So the difference was they weren't worried that their parents would be angry with them for not being the best. Mm -hmm but that all of their life they had been told that they were the best mm -hmm. and they didn't want their parents to know mm -hmm. that they weren't the best. Mm -hmm. And I, my heart broke for them. Mm -hmm. So is that part of what you're talking about? Well, it's our desire to be the best, uh, which really comes from a deep sense of, of low self-worth because we are already in our ordinariness perfect. But because we don't feel that and we haven't been mirrored that back in our own childhood and our parents probably projected their own sense of lack onto us, making us feel like we had to do something to earn approval mm -hmm. rather than uh, understanding that it's our birthright, this striving to be the best is just uh, you know, a, a sure way to, to create uh, crippling anxiety mm -hmm. because you have to be something and what is the best and who defines that? And it's a never-ending, unachievable goal. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't exist. No. It, it's something that's in our fantasy. And here's a scenario where the, the, the young person wouldn't say, I'm angry with my parents. They love their parents. You know, you talk about that. They support, they defend their parents. Yeah. And the same is true in the other direction. So you're talking about conscious. The word conscious is so important because I don't think those parents, any of us parents, would ever do anything intentionally that we thought would hurt our children and make them anxious. Right. If we get a call from university saying, I'm, I'm needing to see a counselor, I'm anxious. Well, in fact, what we think we're doing by teaching our children to achieve and strive to be your best, what we're doing, we believe, is actually buttressing them, is actually preparing them, is actually hmm. creating resilience. But paradoxically, what we're doing is stripping them of it. Because instead of creating a goal outside of themselves to strive for, what our goals really need to be as parents is look within yourself, solace, achievement, peace and contentment is all sitting within you and you're emitting it already. You've already arrived. Now imagine a child who's told that, not with complacency or narcissism, but with a true uh, belief that the parent has, a trust in the child's ability to navigate his or her own knowing, Imagine that child and the capacity that child will have for resilience and achievement versus the other child who's told that this is the yardstick and this is what you need to, to compare to in order to feel worthy. You know, so parents often say to me, well, then how do you create yardsticks? And isn't it important to, to push your child? And I say, no, it isn't. The child needs to be pushed, perhaps to speak their own mind, to know their own vernacular, to understand their own emotions. Yeah, push your child to do that. Push your child to speak up and to assert their will in front of yours. Push your child to know who it is they are on a deep emotional level. Yeah, push your child for that. But don't push your child to meet your needs. So there's a different vibration in the pushing. Mm. It's hard, isn't it? Because we're all damaged in some way. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about is a pretty evolved person who can, in the middle of a, a really intense emotional uh, moment, be able to s stay calm and say, ah, it's raining, as opposed to you know, whatever else they might say. So um, it feels to me when I hear you that, does it take 20 years of therapy to be able to arrive at the place where <laughs> you are conscious? I think I became a therapist, yeah. <laughs> The roads are paved with gold. No, yeah, it, it, 
it is a discipline, you know, people ask me, so how do you do this? You know, and I say certainly not by just listening to me, it's certainly not. Um, you know, just like if you wanted a buffed body, you're not going to just read it in a book and sit on the couch. You're going to take that body to the gym and get the best trainer and really, you know, spruce yourself up into a good shape and change your diet and your mindset. Well, the same way with uh, mindfulness, if we don't practice it daily and truly believe that it is the pathway to success. Because I think the reason mindfulness isn't catching on in the world is because obviously we haven't bought into it. But it is one of the sexiest things we can do. Because by this, we can be greatly connected, not only to ourselves, but to every other living thing out there. And what a high that is to be connected. But to do that, we have to take ourselves to the mind gym. We have to learn meditation or mindfulness or learn to journal, go to a therapist, to be able to see in the mirror what the issues are. You know, we do need the help of someone who's wiser or more experienced to do this. So it, it is an evolution, it is a process, and it's something that if you believed its benefits, you would do it. You know, it's just that it hasn't caught on fast enough. I think mm -hmm. in Vancouver, more than in other places, it's caught on. But if parents understood the power behind it, they would do it. So you were very honest about yourself, you know, and, and you're 10 years into it, and, you know, yes. you got a ways to go. <laughs> but, but tell me about yourself and how you, um, how did you then navigate that using mindfulness? What's an example of how you, you would use mindfulness to help you make sure that you didn't fall into the, the traps that you're talking about? Well, first, you know, I think the only way I can talk about it is because I fall into the trap daily. Mm -hmm. The only difference, perhaps, is that I know how to bring myself out of the trenches and I know which steps to climb and where the ladder is. That's the only difference. But despite knowing what I know, I fall into it like this. It takes a second for me to be triggered. And every day, just like all of you, when you're driving home, you tell yourself, Today I will keep my calm. Today I will be the Zen mother. She will not get to me. He will not get to me. And how long does it take? A second. And then when they fall asleep, of course, the inordinate guilt, right? And then you look at their sleeping faces and you go, never again. And oh, I love you. And I'm so wicked. But tomorrow morning I'll start again. And it takes three seconds when they wake up. And then you remember why you fought yesterday. So it's a, it's a daily battle with me, but now I've come to love the battles and I've come to speak about my unconsciousness and, and the colossal tragedy that I am to my daughter. And she kind of, you know, just looks at me like I'm a sorry mess and what can she do? And, um, you know, she just kind of leaves me there in the puddle of my mess and just walks away because she knows don't pick up the pieces. Um, you, she will be infected. So she just walks away and, and understands. And then, you know, of course, and I say sorry, and then I become even more pathetic. So it's just an unending battle. And, and I just make promises every day to learn more and uh, hope I don't screw her up completely. However, I have insulated myself by writing these books because I'm going to tell the therapist, who she sees when she grows up, <laughs> that I know I'm crazy. See, I've written a book. There's nothing you can tell me that I don't know. So I have, I've just taken care of every angle. So um, I'm prepared. Um, so there is, no, there is no real answer. The only answer is to understand that this is a constant struggle of two agendas, one unconscious and one very conscious, battling for supremacy. And really, it's ours that needs to be shed and surrendered to, detached from, so that our child can reign and fly. Um, but it's, it's daily. It's moment after moment after moment after moment. It's so interesting because when you say that you would, would say to your daughter, um, I mean, I, I would actually be curious to know how you say it, um, how you say I blew it. And um, because the reason we don't do that, I think, is because we want our child to feel safe and we don't want to dump our stuff on them. So I really, but what you're saying is so important. So how do we tell them and let them know that we are flawed as human beings without having them feel unsafe? Well, they know we're flawed, and <laughs> what makes them more unsafe is that we dump it and run. And it's, hmm. it's in our not processing it and not having the courage to say, I screwed up, this is why I was triggered, I get frustrated too, I'm tired too, you know, I'm going to work on this, that actually frees them. 
So it is an ability to go back and mend and tend that will actually set them free. But by pretending like it's not me, it's your dad, and pretending like if only you weren't so annoying, that's the worst kind of prison to leave them in. Mm-hmm. That's actually very good. Um, you know, the examples that you're using are, are ones where uh, the child is doing something or the interaction between you and, and the child is it's doing something that's stirring you up and making you feel frustrated or angry or uh, tantrumy. There's another thing that happens, and I think probably this is the one that got me more, which was when my child was suffering, when my child had a, had a friend who was mean to them, mm. or um, and maybe a, a whole school year where people were mean to them. That's, I think, another example of bringing your own stuff to the table, mm -hmm. and it's not helpful either. So it's not fighting, mm -hmm. but it's something that's equally powerful. Do you know what it was that was triggered in you when that happened? Um, I think I, I'm, I'm, I, the, the obvious answer is just protection. Just like, but it's, you know, I, I understand from what you're saying that there's probably a lot deeper than that, but that was this feeling of protection, you know. Right. So as virtuous as our agenda is, and our agendas are always pitched in the most virtuous way, you protection know, such is as good. protection, <laughs> right? Um, and it is, we do have an earnest desire to protect, but who are we protecting more? It's our own inability to tolerate the pain mm. of another witnessing an inevitable reality in their life. And then we want to micromanage it and control it and call that bully's father and complain to the principal and, mm. you know. And the fact is that the only way to truly protect your child against their inevitable reactions and journey in life is to process it with them, to meet it head on, to discuss the emotions, to create literacy around the emotions, and to trust that your child, because of your connection, will be buffered enough. But we put the other kid down, we teach our kid to become a bully right back, we teach our kid to avoid the pain of pain, and instead, we cripple them. Hmm. Because what's inevitable is the as is. So our ability to enter the as is and teach our children that we are here with them, we can't fix it and we can't control it, but we can process it deeply in an engaged manner. That is the greatest resilience you can offer your child in that moment. So what does that look like for you? The child comes home, let's use that as an example, because there'll be lots of examples as well, and, and actually one um, brave mother actually is gonna come up tonight oh, and tell great. you a story. Examples where there's conflict, uh, and you'll help actually work through that. So um, I'll give you an example from my own life. Uh, there was this dog called Bozo, if you would believe, and Bozo loved to play with Maya, my daughter, and Maya loved to play with Bozo. And this was just following right in alignment with my agenda that my daughter should love animals and animals should love my daughter. So I was very <laughs> happy that things were working out in my life. <laughs> and I was always scared of animals and still am. So I had the reverse projection to make sure that she was completely courageous and not be the wimp I am till today. So Bozo and Maya are playing outside. Maya's about three years old. And before I knew it, Bozo is attacking my daughter, darn dog, and almost bit her, her lower lobe off. So we got Bozo off, and of course my daughter is now scarred for life, and we have to take her to the hospital to get stitches, and, oh and it was quite traumatic. Now, besides of course the profusion of empathy I had for my daughter, what was equally vociferous in my consciousness was, damn dog. Now my daughter's gonna be paranoid of animals just like I was, and he's ruined it all, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do something to that dog, and how dare he? And this was the chatter going on in my mind as much as, of course, I was tending to my daughter. When my daughter came into consciousness later, the first thing out of her mouth was, I hate Bozo. I'm going to get angry with Bozo. I'm going to take him away and do something to him. And she had this outrage against Bozo. And of course, now this was totally not for my agenda. This was working against my plan that she was going to love animals. So of course, I used my influence as a parent and I began rationalizing and telling her, no, you know, poor Bozo, he didn't mean it. He was just distracted. Oh, he must have been hungry and you were so delicious. <laughs> you know, you're so cute. Bozo's so lovely. I love Bozo. And I just kept trying to brainwash her into not feeling pain because the pain of her pain reminded me of my pain as a child 
terrified of animals, and I couldn't have her feeling the same way I did. She must be different. And my daughter, of course, insisted on hating Bozo. And after moments after moments, my husband watching me act quite mad, and he said, you know, what is your problem? She has every right to be angry right now. She, had, she has been violated. Her space has been invaded. She has every right to have this normal human reaction, and you're just stripping her of it. You're just insisting that she think like you and fall into love, and you can whitewash everything, as you always do. <laughs> and so I backed off, and I released my agenda. Very painful to do. And something miraculous happens, of course, when you stop resisting. She hated Bozo, and 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 she hated Bozo. But very soon, her hatred turned to, I miss Bozo. <laughs> Let's go see Bozo. And my daughter loves animals. To this day, continued love and adoration for dogs. So this is just an example of how we mess things up with the purest of intention. Mm. Because really, what stands between us and our children is not our love. It's our conditioning. It's our unconscious baggage and our neediness to have our agenda. Please meet my agenda. Mm. Yeah, you've just raised something else that, that struck me while you were talking, which is uh, it's one thing to be a conscious parent, but you have a partner. In your case, you had a husband as well. So here you have two adults who bring to this mixture their own stuff. Yeah. That makes it really complicated. It really does. And you know, sometimes we, we like to hide behind the fact that you know, I would be really conscious if it weren't for my, my <laughs> spouse. You know? I really don't believe in pressuring my child. But you know, look at him. You know, he just loves baseball so much. So, um, yeah. But that's just our own need to deny the fact that we're not ready to embrace our own consciousness. But is part of the consciousness, is it important that the parents are, are um, both uh, pursuing their consciousness and that they're aware of what their own partner has experienced and why they might be doing that? Is there a partnership there that really matters in your framing uh, as you frame it as consciousness? Well, now the typical answer and the good answer would be, of course, both need to be on the same page and come from the same place, but please, that is so not a reality, and it does not even exist or barely exist. So unfortunately, we're going to have to do the work despite our partners being nowhere on the same page. So you know, we can't wait for people to join us in our consciousness, especially when it comes to our children. I don't believe in it. Of course, if both are on the same page, that makes my work much easier. But I don't wait. You know, husband's not in town, too bad. We're still doing the work. Oh, my wife's ill, we're still going to do the work. There is no better time to start the work than the present moment. And consciousness need not wait for anyone, because the minute it engages with the reality in the home, it changes it. Yeah, I like what you're saying, because it doesn't, it doesn't sound as if we have to become conscious and then begin parenting. Yes. Um, uh, or you don't have to be so hard on yourself that you think, no, oh, I wasn't conscious today. You, you know, you, you're saying it's, it isn't something that's easy. It's something that we have to, in every moment. And, and you do talk in your book about those moments that are most conflictual or most challenging. You can almost become to, come to embrace those moments as an opportunity. Yes. It is when we are the most triggered that we need to simply surrender uh, to the fact that we're triggered only because we're triggered because of our past, because of our baggage, because of our need. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would not be triggered. So there's no such thing as somebody does something to you. They cannot do anything to you mm -hmm. unless the seeds were already there. Yeah, and that you won't be as triggered if you, if you do as you're saying, become, become more conscious of the fact that you are triggered. Yeah, and let me just uh, allude to what you just spoke about, about Darn it, I wasn't conscious today. You know, the wanting to become conscious can become its own happy trap and its own dogmatic uh, agenda. You know, let's be conscious. And I've caught myself many times <laughs> telling my daughter, breathe, breathe, will you? Breathe like this. And I'm, I'm like some crazy person, <laughs> but, but saying all the right things, you know, let's be mindful. You're not being mindful. And so that becomes a whole new trap and a whole new egoic identity of its own. So you have to really be careful not to you know, create more dysfunction yeah. in, in the name of consciousness. We, 
Uh, a group of us at the Dow Lemon Center had a fortune to meet a woman named Lois Holzman who's from New York. And she, she's a wonderful woman. One of the things that she was telling us about is, uh, and actually I've been trying it ever since, is that um, what she does herself and she encourages other people to do, she's involved in theater, is that when they make a mistake, when they get that moment of, oh, you know, yeah. When she was sleeping, I was going to be the perfect mother, and she woke up, and I did it again. That when we make those mistakes, that we should actually say, "Yay, I made a mistake!" Exactly. And actually, it seems like such a silly thing, but it really does work because, first of all, it makes you laugh at yourself for taking it so seriously when you do make mistakes. Right, and you're on top of yourself. You're in the moment. Yes. You understand you've slipped. You own it. You embrace it. You detach from it through humor and you absolve the other from taking on the burden of it. Mm -hmm. So what happens when your child makes a mistake? So we're releasing the child entirely in this scenario of, of um, you know, any responsibility. We're saying it's not the child, it's, it's our own trigger. But what happens when the child does something that's hurtful or something that's just a real mistake? You mean, in other words, be, be a child, right? Yeah, be a human. Uh, be a human being. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's our, it's our level of groundedness that will allow us to tolerate that mistake. You know, if we're really rushed and, and uh, in some heady mind trip and getting ready for a party, say, and looking fabulous, and our daughter comes or our child, son comes and by mistake slips and drops some orange juice on your fabulous outfit, I mean, that's a bad mistake for that child to make. <laughs> that, I mean, so it all depends on our own level of consciousness, right? So, but if we were in our pajamas and, you know, we just discovered that we were promoted and we're in a completely different emotional space and the child spills and drops orange juice on your pajamas, oh, it's okay, we all make mistakes. Mistakes are a growing experience, let's learn from this. So really, it's so random, our teachings of, to our children, it all depends on the emotional space you're in. And the more grounded you are and the more planted you are, in your sense of abundance and inner space. You know, the problem with us is that we are so overscheduled, so over embittered by this pressure to do and succeed and compete that there's really no inner space. We're so tight, so constricted, every moment is accounted mm. for. So then when the child kind of messes things up, there's no tolerance for it. And that's why mindfulness is such a great practice because mindfulness is the inner spaciousness, is the detachment from the agenda, from the agenda, from the control of the agenda. You've released that, so automatically there's this inner space. So when the orange juice spills, it reverberates a little and it sure is annoying, but it's a piece of this larger mm -hmm. space. So there's a capacity to rebound and breathe. But when the space within is just, you know, like a machine gun waiting to go off, then any little thing will erupt it. That's why we need to have a, a bank, um, deep foundation of spaciousness. It's interesting, so what is mindfulness? What, what, are, what are, I mean, obviously you think right away of meditation, but what if you're not a meditator? <sighs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, well, you know, mindfulness is the capacity to watch the, the garbage as it's happening watch the baggage as it's spilling out. It's hard to do when you don't know how to meditate because meditation is watching the workings of the mind moment after moment after moment. So the capacity to introspect is mindfulness. The capacity to, in the moment, understand that what's being emitted from you is coming from your deep vibration, from your past, but you have to see it as it's happening in the moment. And so you have to develop that capacity, that third eye, mm. that can have this dual perspective of engaging, but also being aware at the same time. So that capacity is the mindful capacity. Mm -hmm. And is there a part of it too that has to do with insight, that you, you uh, have somehow, you, you look back at your own life, and you maybe make some sense out of why a particular incident would trigger you and another yes. wouldn't? So, so, yes. is that so, so therapists are extremely valuable, the good ones, because they help you point out your patterns like I talked about. And they really, and this is um, almost, uh, you might think I'm making a parody of our lives because our lives are so complex, but really, they're not. They really fall into two or three emotional patterns. Any client's life, I can chunk it up into two or three emotional patterns. And we're just abducted moment after moment, conflict after conflict, with the same two or three 
emotional patterns. So having insight into your emotional patterns and you know, say, that you're, you've been a pleaser all your life and you have issues with saying no, then you begin to understand why your child doesn't listen to you when you say no, for example. Or if you know that you have issues around food and you've battled with self-image, then you would be compassionate with your child and yourself when you try to fix up your child and fancy them up and doll them up and your mm -hmm. child resists and you're about to enter conflict. So knowing your issues, knowing your baggage, knowing your patterns certainly helps. Mm -hmm. um, what about discipline? So it... it, it We've talked about mistakes and embracing mistakes. You even talk about celebrating mistakes, you know, so you made a mistake. It's not the end of the world. Um, uh, but I think probably some of the pushback that you've heard, I'm sure this is not the first time anybody said this, is, yeah, but you also need to discipline children so that they know what's right and wrong. So um, I'm actually fi uh, finishing up my next book on discipline, so I, I cannot give away all the jewels. <laughs> but. Uh, but really, what we've come to understand as discipline um, and believe that it's teaching and education um, has really come far away from that ideal. And what we've come to use as discipline are just subversive uh, tactics to control our children. Within a connected relationship, a deeply committed, engaged relationship, there should be, technically, ideally, no use of manipulation, control, or coercion. The relationship, the power of the relationship can guide the child. The clarity of your own life is the greatest teacher. The power of the parental presence is so enormous that if we seize it simply through our ownership of our leadership, our children will not need discipline or any techniques of manipulation and threats and yells and reprimand. The clarity of our presence is powerful enough. We just don't know how to execute that power. We just haven't learned how to direct it and channel it in the right way. So if we understood that all our techniques for disciplining our children and our need to control our children is only happening, that need in the house happens because of a lack of connection, then we would change the entire dynamic mm -hmm. around discipline. The need for discipline, the dire need for discipline that we pledge to, you know, I promise you, Dr. Shvali, I wouldn't have slapped my child. You should have seen how he behaved, or I would not have just grounded him for two weeks if, you know, you would do the same thing. This dire desperation to discipline our children and our justification to do so is the red flag to understand that connection is missing. There's no need for more discipline. You know, they come to, parents come to me and say, well, give me the technique, give me the golden key, give me the intervention. What can I say when he says, and they take notes, you know? The, the only need, the only reason there's that desperate need is not because we don't have the clever technique to fix the problem. It's because we don't have connection. Hmm. So the entire focus needs to shift. You know, so the parent will say to me, but my child is so rude to me. What do I do when my child is rolling their eyes and saying, shut up, or you know, something worse, or giving me the finger. What do I do? What, I'm supposed to just walk away? I go, yes, because the reason that's even happening is because there's a profound disconnection. There's a profound severance in the relationship. So this is where the paradox sets in, because the parent is supposed to exercise the most power, the most discipline, when the child is abusing that relationship. And it, it's really challenging for the parent to disengage from their own egoic triggers mm -hmm. and not respond to a, a shut up or I hate you or you're the worst mother. To disengage, to understand, oh, my, I have really messed something up. I need to recreate connection. And you shift away from that. You just physically, forcibly take yourself away from that. Don't react and instead react through connection. I, I just am remembering this great story I heard a, a, a mother told me once. So she had her um, eight-year-old son in the shopping cart in a, like a big, big, huge, one of those huge stores, grocery stores. And she walked away and he proceeded to put his finger inside of every meat package that was in the, in the uh, you know, the meat thing. I don't do the shopping in my house. I don't even know what it's called, but the meat thing like that. And uh, the mom comes back and there is $800 worth of meat that he's put his finger through. So she tries to takes a deep breath. This is a very smart woman. Now I'm listening to you. Takes a deep breath, you know, gets the child, saves his dignity, saves her dignity, gets out of there, 
runs up her credit card. And when she got home, what she did was time in, not time out. Mm -hmm. And what he, she said what she thought he would have liked was to have been put into his room, separated from her, but instead she made him come and bake cookies with her. Mm -hmm. And she spent that time with him, connecting with him, because she probably, now that I'm listening to you, interpreted that as him asking for something that he wasn't getting. And it settled him down, mm -hmm. and, it, and they, then they talked about it. But mm -hmm. that's, I think, probably a really good example. Yeah, it. And is. it's hard to do. Yes, yeah. Yeah, because the kid is, you know, messing up your life on every level and they just don't understand that... Costing you money. Yeah, costing us money. Just so rude and, um, you know, undignified of them to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if there's in one takeaway tonight, I think, actually, that's a very good one. That when we find ourselves in the moment where our impulse is to push that child away, pull the child Absolutely. close. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm.